Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, the humble, the meek, shall inherit the earth. I want you to picture with me two trees, two gardens, the Garden of Eden and the Garden of God yet to come, Revelation 22. The book begins with a garden and ends with a garden. We think about the Garden of Eden and that Adam and Eve walked with God, communed with God, in direct contact with God. They walked with God in the cool of the day. Can you imagine that? What that must have been like to walk with God in the cool of the day. Perfect oasis. Resting, trusting, walking with God in beautiful Eden. But then something happened. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve choose to believe the word of Satan, that serpent of old, and disbelieve what God had said. They put their trust in themselves they rejected trust in God, and they fell. We call that the fall. And from that point forward, after they were removed from the garden, it was obvious throughout God's story, up until this day, that abuse, profanity, violence, immorality, and death has been the mark of humanity. And we look in this land somewhere between the gardens. And we see the weeds of evil flourishing. And when that happens, they get so thick that we have a hard time looking back on the past garden of Eden and looking to the garden of God yet to come because the weeds of evil keep growing and they get right in our faces and they get in front of our eyes and they fill our hearts often with fear and worry. Just this past week, I read a news report of a man who had built some Molotov cocktails. Never made one before. But apparently they go with starting forest fires outside of Portland, Oregon for this guy. And so he made some Molotov cocktails and the police found him throwing them into the forest to start more forest fires. So they arrest him, detain him for 24 hours, let him go. And he starts six more forest fires before they catch him again. Pro-abortionists are winning court battles. Marriage is being redefined as some sort of fluid state, not based on biology or the Bible, but upon popular opinion. You turn on the television, turn on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, you know the bit. Turn on social media, and it's immorality, every vile vice, profanity, Violence, hatred, death, depicted. People are screaming at each other, filled with anger all the time, and the weeds get thick in the land between the gardens. In our families, we wonder what's going to happen to our kids as the weeds get thicker and thicker. As we struggle to see God had done in the past and the garden yet to come. Because evil seems to be prospering. Evil doers aren't resting. They're busy about what they're doing. And so how do we rest? How can we live and rest when evil is prospering? When the weeds of evildoers of wickedness are growing in this land between. We know that we are made for earth, but not the earth as we experience it. Not the earth as we know it. We know by witness in our heart and through the word of God that we're made for this earth. But not the earth as it is right now. We're made for garden, to walk with God. But here we are in the land somewhere between the gardens. So how can we live? How do we rest? When the bad guys are winning, 
when evil is prospering and it's really hard to rest. And we're not really sure how to live in the land between, like we're in exile. That's the theme woven throughout the Old and New Testaments because the children of Israel, they were exiled in Egypt. And later on, they were in exile from the promised land, Israel, when in Assyria, 722 B.C., the northern tribes of Israel were deported, sent out into Assyria, and then later on, the tribes of Judah, the nation of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, exiled to Babylon. And so they were in exile, and they were wondering, how do we live in the land between? And then Peter, he says in the beginning of his first epistle, strangers, foreigners, aliens, calls us as believers in Jesus Christ that we're in this land that isn't our eternal home. How do we live? How do we rest? in that. Well, David, King David wrote a psalm, and this psalm would have been received by people of Israel when they were perhaps in, in the weeds of evil prospering, when the kingdom was divided after David's reign, and the northern tribes and the southern tribes are split apart, or when they're in exile in Assyria and Babylon, and they would have come to this psalm, and they would have had this question answered. How do we rest? How can we live when evil is prospering? And it spans across all time to us today. Psalm 37 gives us, in the first nine verses, four guides, but then there's one central theme that's woven throughout the entire psalm. We're going to just dial in on the first nine verses, and then verses 10 and 11 actually are a summary of the first nine verses. Four guides and how can we live when evil is prospering, when the bad guys seem to be winning in the land of attention somewhere between two trees, the Garden of Eden in the past and the Garden of God yet to come. The first guide that we see in Psalm 37 is that we are to focus forward. To focus is to not have blurry vision but clear vision. Focus forward because the present prospering of evil is not the end of the story. Can I get an amen? It is not the end of the story. And so David reminds us, inspired by God, the Word of God says to us all across time to this day, do not fret because of evildoers. And I love how Hebrew language just says it like it is. It's not theoretical. Fret in the Hebrew means don't be heated. But what happens when you're anxious, when you're worried, when you see evil prospering? Your face gets flushed. Or if you're over the age of 30, your blood pressure goes up. You might get heartburn, insomnia, TMJ. You start fretting, worrying, anxious because of the evildoers. Because the word of God is openly mocked on television. Because Christians are vilified in public office. Because people have no tolerance for the truth of Jesus Christ. And we see that and we go, Argh! and the command, the guide, first is focus forward. Why? Be not envious toward wrongdoers. So don't worry about them and don't want what they have. Because here's the the promise, and each of these commands is linked up with the promise in these first nine verses. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. And soon, my grass, as green it is, as it is today, is going to get all brown and dormant, and some of it's going to die because it already frosted twice in the last week. And that means what's going to come, like next month? Snow. Shh. Snow in November, December. Stuff is going to die. This grass and herbs are temporary. This past summer, my children and I, you saw videos when we were doing all online services of us trying to plant herbs, some parsley, some cilantro, mint, things like that. And so I want to show you a picture of how wonderful our herbs look now, today. After the scorching sun and the frost, so beautiful. Don't you want to season your spaghetti with that? 
It's gone. The prosperity of evildoers is temporary. Focus forward. Have clear vision about this. Don't get anxious about evil prospering. Even when the weeds are growing up in your face and you're filled with heartburn, high blood pressure, TMJ, insomnia, all the rest, you you have to shut off the TV, turn off the phone because it just makes you angry or upset. Flee, fight. Instead, focus forward because it's only temporary. It's short lived. Evil has an epitaph. Evil has an epitaph. Second point when evil is prospering, when you're faced with a tension somewhere between, the second point is this look upward. So focus forward and look upward. Because trusting and delighting in God fulfills the deepest desire of the human heart. Verse 3, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Now I want you to trace your eyes down to verse 4 again. It says, delight yourself in Yahweh, in the Lord. And then it says this, commit your way to the Lord in verse 5. And again, second couplet, trust also in Him. Because... God, in his grace, has redeemed us by his love and called us his children in his covenant with us that he initiated this covenant. We didn't. He did. We're in right relationship with him by his grace. We have received mercy, pardon of all of our sins, transgressions, so we put our trust in him. This would be the call of the entire Old Testament and the New Testament that the People of God who are redeemed in the Lord are to trust in Him, not in themselves. We don't trust in man-made methods. We don't trust in any form, ultimately, of human government. We don't trust in any human. We trust in the God who created everything, who rules everything. We trust in the one upon whom all the governments will rest. The government will rest on His shoulders, and His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so our trust is in Him. Do you agree with that this morning? And so if you are the redeemed in Jesus Christ, we don't trust in ourselves. We trust in God alone. We roll all our anxieties onto Him. That's what the word commit means. Another just simple Hebrew word that means exactly what it means. It means to roll it onto Him, to entrust your worries into His hands. And so when you turn on the news, and so when you hear about evil prospering, you roll it into God's hands because you're trusting in Him, not in yourself. You can't fix it. No government can. Only Jesus can. And He will. And He will. You roll all the anxieties, all the worries all the concern on him. Our hope is in the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our hope, even as much as we might like the country that we live in, our foundational hope as Christians is not in a country, but in Christ. And so we trust in the Lord. And this is how we live in the land between when evil is prospering. We look upward. We delight in the Lord because if we're trusting in the Lord, then the Lord is also our treasure more than anything else. And when he is our trust and when he is our treasure, then we experience peace, even in the tension somewhere between. John Piper said something, and I framed it with an opening sentence. You'll see this on the screen here to my left, to my right. The way a way, the way to fight fear and fretting is to feed faith with what? With the precious and magnificent promise that the pure in heart will see face to face the all satisfying glory of God, the God of all glory. We will see him face to face. There will be a day when we will see him in the garden of God. But today, brothers and sisters, in the land between, we look up Word. We look upward because we know that trusting and delighting in God is the only way 
for the human heart to be fully satisfied. He fulfills our deepest desire. Nothing else, no one else. And the promise linked with that is found He will give you the desires of your heart because if your greatest delight is in God, then your truest and deepest desire is fulfilled in God Himself. Because he made us for himself. He made us to experience perfect love in his presence, in communion with him, to walk with him. And when we treasure him more than anything else or anyone else, he is our desire. And we find he gives us more and more experience of himself, walking with him in the land between even when evil prospers. You might be facing TMJ, insomnia, worry, anxiety. Every time you grab your phone or turn on another type of screen, remember where your trust is. Remember in whom you trust and whose you are. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. command that follows, look back at verse 3, trust in the Lord, and this is always closely linked together across the Bible. Trust in the Lord, because if your trust is in God, the natural outflow of that is that you will do good. You will do the good works of God. You've been saved by grace through faith for good works. You're not saved by good works. You're saved for good works, which God ordained for you to do before the foundation of the world. He chose you, and he ordained you for these beautiful works of God. They're God's source. God initiated works through you by his power. And so, right belief translates to right behavior, to do good. When you're tempted to do wrong, when the weeds grow up in your face and you want to pull off the path, God's people are invited, called to do good. What does that look like? It says this, verse 3, Second half, dwell in the land. Dwell there in the land where you are right now, in the land between the garden. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. It might be easy to go into flight or fleeing mode. I think as Americans, we tend more towards the fight mode. Especially on social media. Right? I don't like what's going on here. Evil's prospering. The weeds are growing in my face. I'm hearing more angering news. I'm going to fight it out. Let me get busy on this and tell people how it is. Here's the third guide. So if we focus forward, we focus forward because the present prospering of evil is not the end of the story. We look upward because trusting and delighting in God fulfills the deepest desire of the human heart. And number three, we cultivate downward Right here, we, we put our roots in this land. We occupy till he comes. Why? Because God's people overcome evil with good. We don't overcome evil with evil. We aren't overcome by evil. We overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Peter says in chapter 2, verse 12 of his first epistle, let your conversation, your way, your manner of life be beautiful, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they see your good works as they observe them and even slander you as evildoers, they will come to glorify God in the day of visitation and the day of his return. You see that? That we are called by the good news of God to live out the beautiful works of God and so that others receive the good news as they observe our good deeds and they too will recognize God as God when he returns. So we're on mission. We cultivate downward. This isn't just a hide away, sit in the corner, sing kumbaya until Jesus comes. Even though I like to go to Glacier National Park and hide away by myself. Wouldn't that be great? You can't come with me though. By myself! Cabin way off in Alaska somewhere by myself. Well, with my beautiful wife and kids. All three of my kids? Okay. I guess so. On a good day. Just kidding. I love all my children, you know that. It's not fight or flee, 
not escapist mentality. God calls his people on mission in the land to do good. This is why Jeremiah received a word from the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 29. You're familiar with the latter half of that. But before he gets to that, for you know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, give you a future and a hope. He announces 70 years of captivity before that, by the way. Put that on your Hallmark card and greet. 70 years of captivity. There is a future and a hope for those who trust in Jesus, who trust in the Lord. But when they're in the land, which for them would be Babylon, which would be evildoers prospering, it says, seek the peace, the welfare, the word in Hebrew, shalom, of the city in which I have placed you. Where I have placed you. Plant gardens, build houses, live in them, get married, have children. Pretty rudimentary, right? It's in doing good that we overcome evil, the good works of God. You overcome evil not with evil. You're not overcome by evil. You overcome evil with good. But it's hard. Think of this, a college student, and she works as a waitress at two different restaurants to try to make ends meet. She's struggling to pay her tuition, to pay her rent, to pay her utility bills. And she goes to work, and the other waitresses, they concoct all sorts of stories so that they can get a bigger tip from the client, from the guests in the restaurant. So she overhears someone say, yeah, my husband's been in Afghanistan for 18 months, and I'm trying to make it. I got two kids at home, and she knows that girl's single and in college. Another story unrolls. There's another girl who stuffs a shirt in her stomach so that she looks pregnant, and then she goes around and tells people how she's pregnant, so she gets double the tips, you know, and puts her sob story out there. May not be hypothetical by personal experience, by the way. And this girl over here saying, I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to follow God's way. And I'm, I can't meet my bills. And they're over here. They party. They get drunk every other night. They're in college. They seem to be happy and fine. You don't get angry. You don't fight. And you don't flee. You continue to do God's way, not the other way. Because, because your trust is in God. Trust in the Lord and do good. He fulfills the deepest desire of the human heart in himself. And he guides us when we roll all our anxieties into him. And here's the promise coupled with this third call. To cultivate downward. Overcome evil with good. Verse 6. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. What does that mean? It means that there will be a day, there will be a day when God himself will publicly defend and vindicate his people. There will be justice, there will be righteous judgment upon the earth, and God himself will vindicate all those who are vilified. He will defend us, and that judgment will be as bright as the noon hour sun today. Everybody will see it. That's the idea. Nobody will be able to escape it. It will be there out for everybody that justice and righteousness will reign. And those who follow and trust in the Lord and do good, their God, our God, in whom we put our trust, defends us. And so we cultivate downward. We put our roots in this earth because God's people overcome evil with the good works of God. And then the final command is this. Number four, the guide is to rest inwardly. Focus forward, look upward, cultivate downward. Rest inward. Because those who trust in the Lord have a better future home. Look with me in verse seven. Rest in the Lord. Which also could be translated, be still, be silent. Talking. Stop getting angry on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, which is kind of the water cooler of 20 years ago, but the water cooler was a nicer place to talk to people. We see evil prospering. We don't fix it because our trust is not in ourselves. Our trust is in the God of goodness and righteousness. 
who's placed us in this land somewhere between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of God. So we can wait, rest, wait. When your heartburn starts going, when your headache, tension headache in the back of your neck starts going, Rest in God. Because if you have your trust in the Lord, you know you have a better future home. So we can wait for it. Wait for it. Wait patiently for him. Wait longingly for him. And here he's going to repeat the same phrase that he began with. Do not fret. Look at me. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. When evil's prospering, don't get heated about it. Don't get angry. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes, cease from anger and forsake wrath. There it is again. I underlined it because I need to hear this. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. See, when we get angry, angry when we try to fix, solve on our own, it only leads to us getting sucked into the evil that's prospering all around us. God's people trust in someone outside of themselves. And so we overcome evil with God. And so we have a better future home. And so we can plant roots here and cultivate faithfulness. Another way to translate that phrase, cultivate faithfulness, to circle back, is to feed on his faithfulness. Don't you love that? Feed on his steadfast always and forever love. It's never going to let you go. He is pursuing you. He's going to chase you down with his love. He's going to guide you through life. He's saying, I am with you. If you trust in me, put your trust in me, even in the land summer between the gardens, when everything seems like it's going to evil, I've not forgotten you. I've not forsaken you. So forsake your wrath. James reminds us the anger of humankind, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We overcome evil with good. And we can rest inwardly because it's not banking on us. Our trust is in the sovereign king. Where is your trust today? Is it in the FDIC insured bank that you have your stuff in? Back when I was a kid, it said $100,000 insured. I think it's maybe two hundred fifty k now. I don't really trust the FDIC. Just saying. Is it in your portfolio? Is it in your collection of things in your basement, in your safe, in your house, in your boats and cars and whatever, in your education, in your experience, in your job, in your intellect, in your family? To trust in the Lord is to forsake all the other options. False hopes, false saviors, false gods, false methods of man instead choose to trust in God. To do good is to abhor what is evil and cling onto the goodness of God. And when we walk in that step by step walk in a land between, we can rest and wait and not fret, not get heated like we're all tempted to do. And the message continues. Look with me down in verse 9. For evildoers will be cut off. Remember, their prosperity is temporary. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. The land. People have said that Psalm 37 is an exposition of Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble, repeats it again, will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. This is the shalom that we wait for, that we look for in the garden of God. Revelation 22, that there is a tree that has 12 kinds of fruit. 
bearing every month for the healing of the nations. And we will be with him, and he will be with us, and we will dwell with him forever and ever. As people who've been grafted in through the new covenant in Christ's blood, we have peace with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. We are inheritors with all the saints in light. Are you getting this? We will inherit the land. God promised to Abraham land, seed, posterity, that is, blessing. Through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, God promised to Abraham, in his Abrahamic covenant, we call it. And all those who place their faith in God's Messiah, who is Jesus Christ, we receive entrance into God's family. We're grafted in, and we know that when Jesus Christ returns, he will establish his glorious kingdom on the earth, made new. It's not a new thing It's not all new things, it's all things made new, because that's the kind of God we have. He makes everything new again. He redeems, he resurrects, he glorifies. And so it's the earth redeemed, made new, remade, and we will inherit. Jesus expands the promise. You see, Psalm 37 was written to the nation of Israel. Jesus says, the humble Those who have their total trust not in themselves but in God, that's what true humility is, will inherit the earth. The earth. Yes, the earth. Not the earth as we know it. But the earth made new. It's really easy to lose sight of the garden of the past and the garden yet to come when the weeds of evil prospering are in our faces. This past Friday, I took all three kids to form our nature preserve, and that's a pretty big place. I don't know how many acres, but there are a lot of acres of woods, lots of trails. I think Hudson's maybe been there once before, Carson once before. I don't know if Everlyn's ever been there. Stephanie was in a school meeting just down the street. And so we go around the trail, and Hudson is enjoying everything. Seen butterflies, listen to the birds, walk way back and then around a pond. And then he saw something that caught his eye and he went after it. Of course, I have Carson, who's three, and Everlyn, who's eight. And so I can't, I'm like, okay, I got to keep them with me. So we say, hey, Hudson, come back, Hudson. And then we couldn't see him anymore. So we walk around and I can't run off because my three year old can't run. So we walk around trying to look for Hudson, make our way to the visitor center, about 20 minutes go by. I did not tell Stephanie this happened until after the fact. I'm like, okay, when Stephanie gets back here, and then I can run around all the trails and try to find him. 20 minutes go by and my phone rings. Hello, we're with your son Hudson. Really? Tell me about this. Yeah, we're, we're here, my wife and I, and our two little grandkids, and uh, he said he can't find you. I'm like, no, we can't find him. <laughs> we're at, where are you? We're at, we're at the visitor center. Okay, we'll, we'll meet you there. So about five, six minutes later, here they come, and Hudson looks like what? Heated in the face, anxious, worried. He starts looking at me, Dad, where'd you go? Because the bushes. And the trees, I couldn't see anything. You were gone. You were gone. Where'd you go? We were here. We were looking for you. (sighs) Did you leave me? No, we didn't leave you. We we didn't. I think you kind of left us, Hudson. I think that's how we're with God in the land between. God, where are you? All the bushes, the weeds, the trees. Can't see. Where'd you go? Have you left me? And God's saying, no, no. Rest. Wait. Trust. I am with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Those who trust in the Lord have a better future home. Focus forward. Look upward. Cultivate downward. Rest inward. 
Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment? And ask yourself, as I ask myself this question, in where or in what or in whom am I trusting? Am I getting anxious, worried, fretting, filled with fear? Here is the bottom line idea, brothers and sisters. The truth is that trusting in the God and delighting in God leads us to resting in God, in the land between, in this tension of the somewhere between. So where for you do you get stuck? Is it in trusting in all the other options, false hopes, false saviors? Near humans, human government, human innovation, business, money. Is that where you get stuck? Or is it in delighting in God that you, your treasure is diverted to other things or people? Or maybe you're just not resting because you're still trying to work, 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 work your way through the weeds. Where do you see evil prospering? Maybe in your workplace, in your home, in the news, on your kids maybe. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord because there will be a day eternity, through God's sovereignty, rights the wrongs of time. Lord God, we confess today that we are so often prone to fret and fear, fight, flee, none of which is the path of trust. We pray, O oh God, that as we walk in the land between that we would walk every moment trusting in you, being guided by you, serving you, delighting in you, because, oh God, you are our treasure. We delight in you, no one else. You fulfill the deepest desire of our heart. Oh, satisfy our deepest longings with you as your word promises. Help us to see clearly the way forward as we look upward, cultivate, in faithfulness to you, where you've placed us, and to rest inwardly through it all, because we're waiting on you. That is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.